I'm going to just uh, talk about the global economy and do it uh, by trying to put a human face on it, a human face behind uh, the labels. And I'll just tell a bunch of stories and, until uh, you've had enough and you scream and run out of the room, and then, and then we'll know the meeting's over. Um, last week, I spent uh, the week with two women from El Salvador who worked in a maquila company, and they had been fired because they tried to to meet to learn their rights. They worked in a place called Caribbean Apparel. This was Blanca Palacios and uh, Lorena Carmen. They worked in Caribbean Apparel in El Salvador where they sewed clothing for Kathy Lee Gifford's Walmart label and also for Kmart and Leslie Fay. Like I said, they were fired because they dared to meet to learn their rights and to defend themselves and end the maltreatments in the factory. I also was with uh, a young man about 25 years old, who was a union organizer, Giovanni Fuentes. And because he worked with the women in this factory, because he advised them on their legal rights, he received two death threats. He was called in by the company attorney, and he was told, uh, Giovanni, uh, you and your friends should leave the work uh, if you want to live. We suggest you leave the work. Giovanni, you understand that when you're dealing with the killer in El Salvador, you're dealing with the mafia. And Giovanni, you have to understand that in El Salvador, you can have someone killed for 100 colonas. That's about $12.50. That's why we took these workers immediately to the United States, to throw some protection over them, some public visibility. And it worked. And one of the reasons it worked was because of the students. Uh, we did a couple of press conferences. I was told there were 550 press hits, or radio stations, newspapers, or TV, uh, enough to cover them, enough to protect them help protect them and defend their rights. They went back to El Salvador on, on Tuesday of last week, and we're monitoring the situation as closely as we can. Caribbean apparel is typical of sweatshops throughout Latin America or Asia. It's located in a place called the American Free Trade Zone in Santa Ana. It's about an hour and a half from San Salvador. It's surrounded by the cinder block walls, by the barbed wire, by the lock metal gates, by the armed guards. Inside the factory, uh, young women are locked for 12 hours a day, essentially 11 hour shifts, six days a week, from 6.10 in the morning, excuse me, 6.50 in the morning until about 6.10 at night, or 6.40, and sometimes they work until 9.40. Of course, all the overtime work is forced. If they don't stay for the overtime, they're fired. The factory is about 100 degrees, there's no proper ventilation. It's a true sweatshop in that sense. The women are paid 60 cents an hour, which meets one third of the cost of living. It's not even close to a subsistence wage. They made these Kathy Lee pants, and for every $16.96 pair of pants they made, they got paid 15 cents, these, these pants here. Supervisors went up and down the aisles. It's all done by piecework. They're all in the production lines. And they would smash the, the tables at a sewing machine and tell them to go faster. You know, stop, uh, stop having your, you know, stop the, your mind from wandering. Get down to work. You're not here for a vacation. They're not allowed to talk to each other. Typical in the factories, they could use the bathroom twice a day, once in the morning and once in the afternoon, and they need permission in order to use the, the bathroom. This place, like the other factories, they wouldn't give the workers clean water to drink. They drink filthy tap water. Women refer to it as, as urine. It's, comes, uh, it's warm, it's yellow, it makes them sick to their stomach. In order to get a job you had to, in this factory, you had to take pregnancy tests. And if you tested positive, you were fired, you had to pay for those pregnancy tests. But the big issue was just fear. I mean, there was sexual harassment. If the supervisor liked one of the younger women and you didn't uh, express interest in him, you'd be fired. They would scream at the workers. If they thought a worker was getting a little too uppity, they'd lock the young woman in a room in isolation for several hours. There were even incidences where the supervisors would jab the women with the scissors that, you know, they were cutting the threads off their clothing with. You know, just teach them a lesson. And there were even accounts of women being hit in the factory. But the biggest issue underlying the factory for the workers was the fear. The constant reminder that you'll be fired if you try to meet to learn your rights that you'll be fired if you even carry around the country's labor code. Because if you have the labor laws of the country, you're a troublemaker. And you better get rid of that troublemaker before the disease spreads. 
you'll be fired if they even see you meeting and grouping together. Even if they don't know what you're meeting about, you'll fire three or four people just to send a message. You better not be meeting about something serious. You better not be meeting about your rights. And of course, if you try to organize, you won't be fired, you'll be blacklisted immediately. And those are the conditions at Caribbean Apparel. I'm going to come back to it, but of course, Kathy Lee uh, got upset again and, and went on her television program and went on the attack. And uh, we had a little run in with her husband, Frank Gifford. And at the end of it, they were saying that uh, Kathy Lee was the Joan of Arc of sweatshops. And the Washington Post commented, well, she must be hearing some very strange voices. And so we'll come back to it. I think they made a lot of mistakes, but they tried to crash our press conferences, and I think it, it blew up in their face. Well, I'm going to stick with El Salvador for a second. We were meeting with women at a factory called Dual, which in El Salvador, it's another one of the maquilas which produces garments for export to the United States. And the women have told us uh, over the years that they're forced to work, same thing, 6, 6.45 in the morning until 7 o'clock at night, a 12-hour shift. However, three or four nights a week, they work until 10.30. So they're working a 15 and a half hour shift. And right now, during the busy season, they work on Saturday until six, and on Sunday they work until five o'clock. So they're working seven days a week. And it's the same process. To get a job in these factories, you have to undertake, undergo these pregnancy tests. And if you test positive, you're fired. You come into the factory, and it's that same pressure to produce, 115 to 150 pieces an hour. The same screaming, the locked bathrooms, the no water, they tell us the factory is like vapor, it's like steam. Women are actually fainting during the workday. And the same fear, that every time the workers try to meet to assert their rights, they're fired. This factory, this Dual factory, makes this, these Liz Claiborne garments. So, for example, at the Dual factory, they made this $198 Liz Claiborne jacket. The women were paid 74 cents to make it. So the wages that the women were paid come to only four-tenths of one percent of the retail price of the garment. We sent students down from Columbia University, graduate students, to meet with the women that worked in this dual factory to do a living wage study. Well, the wage is adequate to survive on. Of course, they found out that the wages came to only about one-third of the real cost of living at a subsistence level. These are truly starvation wages, arbitrarily set. And we're going to release this report in about two weeks. But just because women from the Dual factory met with the students from Columbia University, they were fired. I think that's one of the reports we left outside. They were called in one by one, five women, and they said, the management said to them, you're fired for crying to the gringos, and we don't want a union here, just for meeting with U.S. students. And of course, they've tried to organize a union at this particular factory five times, and each time it's been crushed with illegal firings and blacklistings. Not far from that factory, there was a place called Formosa Textiles. And we found out about this factory because a woman who had been working there had been beaten and fired. And she went into a human rights office, Cota Farm in El Salvador, and she wanted to file a complaint. She wanted help. And she explained that she had been attacked at work. And they asked her what her crime was, what she did. She said, well, I took a day off from work because I'm a single mother and I had a three-year-old daughter and she was sick and I had no money to put her to daycare. It cost about $1.63 a day for daycare. I didn't have a single cent, and I had to stay with her. When she went to work the next day, she was attacked by her supervisor, who was a man much larger than her, and she described that, that he grabbed her by the shoulders, and he took his knee, and he kneed her in the thigh very hard so that her whole thigh was black and blue. He tried to slap her a few times. As she ran away to escape, he tried to lunge out and kick her and knock her over. She ran away crying, and they fired her. And they said to her, well, what label do you make and she made Nike shirts in El Salvador, so we can talk about Nike justice. By the way, the women were paid uh, 20 cents to make this $75 Nike shirt. So this, is, this reaches almost new levels of exploitation. Maybe Disney's the only other company that comes close, because now the wages are down to 3 tenths of 1% of the retail price of the garment. And the women walked us through their day. Exact same, I mean, I'm repeating myself, but to get a job in the factory, mandatory pregnancy test. They charge the workers 90 colonas, that's two days pay, to take the test, and if they test positive, they're fired. The same forced overtime, 12-hour shift. 
and they help the workers stay, the Nike contract, it helps the workers because at the end of the eight hour shift, when you'd be going home, say at 540, they keep them until seven or later, they take the time cards away from them. So that if they were to leave without staying for the overtime, they wouldn't be paid for the entire day. They'd lose the whole day's wages. Besides, if they didn't stay for the overtime, they'd be suspended without pay and then eventually fired. So you got the same forced overtime, the same pregnancy test, the same heat, lack of ventilation, and the women told us that they were searched on the way into the factory to take candy away from them. This is also typical. But Nike, you see, doesn't want the workers bringing in Tootsie Rolls. God forbid they should get a little chocolate stain on their garment. So on the Nike Justice, you search. They take candy and water away from you. The women are not allowed to talk to each other because they need to keep the production going. In this particular factory, called Formosa Textiles, they brought in the supervisors. It's a Korean-owned factory in El Salvador. They brought the supervisors from Bangladesh because they figured the men would be a lot tougher on the women. And, and indeed, they were. And they would be yelling at them to go faster. For that reason, they were not allowed to use the bathroom. The same system, you raise your hand, you get a ticket, you're presented to the guard at the toilet. You can use the bathroom once in the morning and once in the afternoon. You could drink water once in this factory. Same thing, get the ticket, give it to the guard at the sink, and you could drink the filthy tap water. That makes the woman sick. In this factory, you couldn't wear any makeup, which struck us, you know, we hadn't heard that one before. Like, why can't you wear makeup? And of course, it was because the factory was 100 degrees, and Nike was afraid that the women would sweat and wipe the perspiration from their faces with the Nike garment, and if they were wearing lipstick or other makeup, it would again soil the garment. Nike would lose a few pennies. So that's a serious offense. They patrol the aisles looking for lipstick. And if you got it, you're out of there, and you're fined, and you lose the day's pay. The same firings, the same fear, anyone who stood up to defend their rights or even question their rights was fired. And I said to the women uh, in the factory, like, what about the Nike code of conduct? You know, they say they got this code of conduct that defends the rights of workers everywhere in the world. And the workers said, sure, they have a code of conduct. They make us wash our hands in the morning. That's the part of it they, uh, they impose because they don't want us getting the, the garments dirty. And when we do white Nike garments, they give us plastic gloves to wear. So that was their code of conduct. Uh, that was the Nike code of conduct, the Nike justice. Now, I don't know if you can, if you can see these, <clears throat> but this, this is the factory that made the Liz Claiborne garments. It's exactly like the factory that made the Nike garments. It could be, it's in El Salvador, but it could be anywhere in Central America or anywhere in Asia. It's always the same. The cinder block wall or a concrete wall 15 foot high, topped with the razor wire, the locked metal gate, and the young women lining up to go into work. If any students here, if you came up afterwards and looked at this, these people are younger than you are. But they're not in a great university. They're not getting an education. They're going into factories where they're locked for 12 hours a day. You can see they're, they're very young. And on the ground, there's pieces of plastic because there's no place for them to eat. So when they go out during lunch hour, they either sit in the mud or the dirt. And to protect themselves, they bring pieces of plastic, which is why the plastic's laying around. When the door opens, the young women go through, and behind the door, there's always an armed thug. He jumped out of the way when he saw my camera. And, you know, it's not like they carry little sticks or batons. They carry sort of shotguns and big rifles. All of these factories are in exactly the same position. In El Salvador, 80% of the workers, at least, are women. 50% of them are single mothers, young women. They go into these factories where they're locked behind the metal gates, the thugs, the barbed wire. I'm going to tell you a, a short story about trying to research these places and what it's like for the women. We were out in front of this dual factory, and we, we always try new techniques, because everything you do has to be done in a clandestine manner. You could never walk up in front of these factories to do interviews. I've been in front of these factories when the armed thugs have kept out members of the labor ministry. And they just laugh at the people from the government. They say, uh, oh, the boss isn't here you want to see. Come back tomorrow. And of course, if you went back tomorrow, the boss isn't there either. No one goes in and out of these factories that the thugs don't want to go in there. If any of the students here worked in a factory there and if their parents wanted to get them a message or there was an emergency or medicine or, or some message, uh, they'd be shot before they could get into these factories. Well, we were using a van, a, a van with polarized windows. We figured we could do some of our interviews like that. We'd take the van, we'd park it about maybe 100 yards away from the, the factory, 
and we'd have fired workers who we were working with would go out of the van back to the workers during lunchtime and she'd say there's some labor rights people from the United States they're interested in your case perhaps they can help and the women would come around to the van we'd throw open the door they'd jump in the van we'd smash the door close it shut and no one could see us you couldn't see into this van and we did a lot of interviews like that someone saw us from the factory and we're sitting in the van doing an interview and all of a sudden a pickup truck comes up behind us and the doors open on both sides and two guys get out with shotguns and they make a big sweep coming towards our van like that and we decided on a spur of the moment just pull out as fast as we could possibly go and obviously we did and we left as we made the turn there was a bus stop and we left the women off at the bus stop so that they could innocently pretend they were waiting for a bus we kept going this 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 uh, this truck followed us for about 15 minutes it, it, or at least it, it felt like that it felt endless so it's not possible to just waltz up to these places and research a little while ago I'm losing track of time but it was this summer we were in El Salvador with students from five different universities on a delegation we're making a video about the student movement and we wanted to make a video through the students eyes what it was like when they met with workers their own ages what was like when they saw the factories what was it like when we went into the neighborhoods and saw how people lived? what was it like to talk to people who had been beaten up by their managers and fired well we went to a Nike factory the factory that makes this for most of the textiles in Evergreen and of course we were turned away by the armed guards we were not allowed entry even though we told a few white lies the students said that they were interns student interns with Nike but uh, they didn't fall for it and the manager came out and said uh, Nike determines who comes in and out of this factory period and uh, they didn't alert us to your visit so you're not coming in but you could see the workers with little Nike vests on little swishes uh, with the armed guards and they were working uh, behind the behind the fence we left there we went to a place called Santa Ana where the Caribbean apparel factory was also located and through the research we knew there was a factory called Exmodica which also made Nike's clothing but children's clothing we went to the factory we got there just at lunchtime and the gate was open because the workers were coming in and out for lunch there was an armed guard right next to the to, to the door I had some Nike clothing I'd purchased in New York because we're doing research on the pricing of the garments so I said to the students let's go the doors open we walked right up the armed guard figured we must be North American buyers or whatever we said good afternoon to him and we walked right past the guy with the gun and we went into the factory and we we're walking around the factory and yes it was confirmed they were making Nike's children's clothing they were doing Adidas they were doing Lee and you know I get nervous when I do this we're in the factory I knew we were gonna get you know captured eventually and we're taking pictures and we're doing a videotape and I'm doing an interview standing up inside the factory and I found labels that said made in the USA now either they were doing transshipments illegal transshipments or uh, maybe there were samples but anyway we're eventually surrounded you know maybe it took about five minutes we're eventually surrounded by the management and I expected them to say you know throw us out and yell and scream a little bit and they're asking me what are you doing in here and I said the door was open which it was and we're in here and they're screaming but then they turned very violent and they attacked the students especially the women and they saw the cameras and they went ballistic and so they're grabbing the students and they're trying to pull them down at the same time they're trying to drag the cameras off their necks and at first the students were resisting and you know eventually I was watching this thing and it was getting uh, kind of rough and almost out of control so I said to everybody give up the film they broke one of the cameras they took the film and I see the manager and he's standing there and he's going like this he's screaming at the top of his lungs and he's going like this of course he's calling over the shotguns which they did come then we were surrounded by the people with the shotguns so this is North American students in a factory and we're being attacked and we're surrounded by these thugs and these goons well they did take the camera but I was hooked up with a microphone so which they didn't discover so at least we got out with the sounds of these people screaming at us yelling and telling us in El Salvador we'd do anything we damn well please and uh, in fact the factory Exmodica is owned by the sister of the former president of El Salvador Calderon Sol who's really the power behind the recently elected uh, President Flores and when we came out of the factory we knew we only had a little bit of time to get away from that because they would call the police so we left there and we went to a square in Santa Ana and we interviewed the students immediately right after this uh, incident in the factory and it turned out to be really uh, very moving 
because the students had tasted a tiny bit of the repression that these workers face every single day. If they're doing that to students from Yale and from University of Kentucky and Middlebury and Vermont, if they're doing this to the students, the message came through loud and clear. The women in that factory have no rights. If they ever stood up for higher wages or more respect or dignity, I, they would be uh, uh, handled uh, very, very, uh, very toughly. Salvadorans we were with told us, labor people, human rights people, that if they had gone into the factory with us, they'd probably be hanging up somewhere, getting electric shock treatment, you know. Uh, we were laughing about it afterwards because we were so nervous. But those interviews are going into the tape we're doing now. I uh, hope it, uh, Nike's happy about it. The tape left that factory, the Nike factory. They stole a tape out of one of the video cameras and they sent it to a factory that produces for Walmart, which was why the death threats came about because they saw our discussions on this tape, why the Giovanni was threatened with death. Well, you know, in El Salvador right now, there's 225 factories. Used as an example, 225 Maquila factories, 70,000 young women working in those factories. They produce 581 million garments a year for export to the United States. It's up now, it's 50 million garments a month. El Salvador, tiny El Salvador, is the seventh largest exporter of apparel to the United States worldwide. Imports of apparel have grown from 198 million in 1992 to 1.2 billion last year, a 600% increase. Everything's booming except worker rights. There's not one single union in any of the Maquila in El Salvador because it's not allowed. Despite the pregnancy test, the starvation wages, the beatings, the humiliation, people being stripped of their rights, despite all of that, the heat, the lack of water, the locked bathrooms, there's not one single union because every time the workers try to defend themselves, they're fired and blacklisted. Not one. The Maquila is booming. Now there's talk in El Salvador of lowering the wages from 60 cents an hour to 36 cents an hour. They say it's too high, the 60 cents. This is the World Trade Organization. They're saying it's too high. It's too high, we better lower it in the countryside to 36 cents an hour. Well, you know, if Nike had the chance to come in here, that would be nice if they did. Uh, if Nike came in here, they'd say to you, you're a decent people here, it's Sunday night, what are you doing here? You should be home watching television or something. But, but don't be naive, 60 cents is, is a good wage. You're not living in Seattle or New York City, you're in El Salvador, you can live on 60 cents. It's a good wage, these are good jobs. And when you ask the women about that, they look you right in the face and they say it's a lie because you cannot live on the 60 cent wages and they run us through their day real quickly that just to get back and forth to work costs 68 cents. A tiny breakfast at the job since they're getting up so early you know, when you think of it, when they're working these 6.45 in the morning shifts, 6.45 until 7 o'clock at night or 10.30, workers are getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning and getting home at 7.30 or 11.30 with no chance at all to spend with their children. I mean, it's completely, what strikes you is the exhaustion of the people, the bags under their eyes, the lack of sleep, the, the lack of any decent food, the constant pressure and screaming at the workers. Well. Anyway, they spend 80 cents for a small breakfast. Rice, beans, you know, maybe a little roll, a cup of coffee. For lunch, it costs them $1.49. The exact same thing. Rice, beans, maybe a scrap of chicken, tortilla, and a, and a lemonade. Fake lemonade, they call it, because they can't afford soda. It's too expensive. Well, that's $2.97. The wages are 60 cents an hour, actually a little bit less. So the daily pay is 42 colonas, which is $4.79. So your daily pay is $4.79, you take out $2.97 just for the round trip bus and for breakfast and lunch, and you're left with $1.82. Well, you have to live somewhere. So for a one-room hovel in El Salvador that a whole family will share, one room, without indoor plumbing, you use an outhouse, and there'll be one sink that several families will share, that's $31.40 a month. That's $1.03 a day. When you take the dollar three from the $1.82 and you're left with 79 cents. But what do you do now? The cheapest supper you could have is about $1.14 for the exact same thing. A family of three, 38 cents a piece. Each person would be allotted 38 cents to eat supper. Rice, beans, maybe they'd split a, a plantain, one plantain for a family of three, and coffee. Well, they can't even afford that because they're only left with 79 cents. Women in El Salvador are raising their children on coffee because they can't afford milk. Something is completely crazy and viciously wrong when women could be making $75 Nike shirts 
and yet they're raising their, their children on coffee. Or they're making the Liz Claiborne jackets, $198 jackets, and they're raising their children on coffee. They tell us maybe, maybe uh, the two paydays, they're paid every 14, 15 days, maybe on those two paydays they buy a little bit of milk. But they can't afford any vitamins, or they can't afford any vegetables, or cereal, or juice for their kids. Nothing. And you ask them what they would do if they had a little bit better a wage. And they say they'd buy milk, school books, clothing for their kids to go to school. It cost $8 for new shoes to send your kid to school. Like I said before, about $1.63 a day for daycare. None of this can they afford. The Nike shirts, it's a special shirt. It says that it takes the sweat off your body and throws it into the air so you stay dry. And when we read this to the women, they all started laughing. They said, well, we need these things because it's 100 degrees in the factory. We ought to be able to, we ought to be wearing them. And, uh, well, what would happen if Nike paid a subsistence wage to the workers? The workers have told us that if they could have their wages increase from 60 cents to about $1.18 an hour, they could climb out of misery and into poverty. Now, would the whole sky fall in on Nike if they paid a subsistence wage? No. If Nike paid them $1.18 an hour, there would be 39 and a half cents of labor in the shirt, which is less than one half of 1% of the retail price of the shirt. At 60 cents an hour, there's 20 cents of labor. At $1.18 an hour, there would be 39 and a half cents. In other words, there's enormous greed driving this whole thing, enormous greed. And the student should never pull back from the issue of a living wage. It's very possible. And, it's, and, and if you keep going, you're going to win this thing. The Liz Claiborne jacket, 74 cents of labor in it. If, if Liz Claiborne paid the workers a sustainable wage, there'd be about $1.44 or $1.45 of labor in this jacket, less than 9 tenths of 1% of the retail price of the garment. They could easily afford to do it. The other day, Oh, that's actually uh, now, I guess, probably like two months. Nike put out a press release. They're very sophisticated. They spent $650 million a year in advertising. They put out a press release and they said, we are raising the wages of our workers in Indonesia from 250,000 rupiah to 265,000 rupiah. And a 6% wage increase. And the media applauded and actually uh, recognized the great social conscience of Nike. And I smelt the rat, I figured something's going on here. So I went and I looked up the value of the rupiah to the dollar, and of course, at that particular time, there were 10,080 rupiah to the dollar. So Nike gave a wage increase, all right, from 14 cents an hour to 15 cents an hour. They gave a one cent increase to their workers. Nike's got 70,000 workers in Indonesia. Nike makes 20 million pairs of sneakers a year in Vietnam, paying the workers 33 cents an hour. And in China, Nike uses one factory compound called Yuyen, where there are 50 to 60,000 workers in one factory com complex. There are only 37,000 footwear workers left in the entire United States. There's more workers in one factory making sneakers for Nike in China than there is in the entire United States. I was in China this summer, and we went to a, 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 in northern China to a city called Jiazhou, and there were 21,000 workers there making Nike sneakers. And Nike had swooshes on the factories, and it said, just do it, right behind the barbed wire and the locked metal gates and the thugs. They're very proud of it. The workers were paid 23 cents an hour, and they were working 12-hour shifts. Just do it. Nike's very proud of itself. We went into a factory in China that made kid sneakers. And the women in the factory, very young, we'll come back to this, but all of the workers in China are 17 to 25 years of age. At 25 years of age, you're fired because of the 16-hour shifts, you're all used up anyway, and you may get pregnant and they're not going to pay maternity benefits, so you're, you're gone at 25. Well, in this factory, the women look very young, 16 or even younger. And they were putting the glue on the kids with their bare hands. Toxic glue was right next to them. X, 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 strong, which they couldn't, of course, couldn't read. But when you went through the factory, your eyes were stinging you, and the implement they had given the workers was a toothbrush. So they had their toxic glues and they were putting it on with the toothbrush in their hands. And there was no respirators, no nothing, no, no gloves, zero. Uh, no, no proper ventilation. And at the end of the day, the workers had to leave the factory in single file as an imposition of discipline on these workers. If you were the, the head of a production line, you were like production line one. Well, you stood up with your sign one 
and all of the workers at the end of the day had to gather together behind you in single file and you left the factory. Whole lines of workers like that, just to let them know who the boss is and that discipline will be maintained. And it wasn't just sneakers and, and garments, although there was a company called Deep E, which is a small progressive shoe company in Oregon. And they said, they're a part of Corp America, and they said that we use hemp, uh, you know, natural hemp, but we make the shoes in China, and the workers get paid $3.15 an hour. This is what the boss said. Well, we found the factory. It took us a long time to find it. It's the middle of nowhere. But it was surrounded by four guard towers, like a prison camp. The workers were locked in. There were dormitories there. And in fact, they were paid uh, 23 cents an hour. So they were off several thousand percent in their estimate of the wages. And a lot of that goes on because no one's watching. No one's looking. We went into a factory that made Alpine car stereos, the top of the line. I mean, if you check your, if you check your car stereo, see if it's an Alpine stereo, made in China. The women were forced to work 10 hours a day, and they sat at mic microscopes, and they did the soldering of the very fine pieces. And they'd be there, I don't know how they would be able to concentrate for 10 hours like that, looking through these microscopes. I mean, it must have been so exhausting. And above them was an electronic scoreboard informing them what their daily production quota was, what, how many stereos they should have produced, as opposed to how many stereos they did produce, and they were monitored like that every few minutes. They were paid 35 cents an hour. Top of the line technical job in China, 35 cents an hour. And we'll come back to this. Of course, no right to organize, no independent unions, no independent religious or human rights groups, no independent, uh, independent women's groups, zero. Well, uh, talk about Phil Knight's greed a little bit. The guy is worth 5.8 billion, the Nike guy. 5.8 billion dollars. And I sat down one Saturday and I wanted to figure out what the hell do you do with $5.8 billion? What can you do with it? Well, how much money do these people need? So I called the travel agent and I said, I want to fly around the world first class. And they told me $10,282.50. Then I called the Waldorf Astoria in New York and I said, I want a room and I want three meals a day and don't give me no continental breakfast. I want the real thing, three meals a day. I could get that for about 500. And then I called a car dealership and I wanted a brand new Lincoln Continental. And I was told I could get one for 36000 Phil Knight could fly around the world first class every single day. He could stay at the Waldorf Astoria and have three meals every single day. He could buy a brand new Lincoln Continental every single week, and he could do it for the next 1,044 years. And yet they continued to suck the wealth off the backs of young women locked in factories around the world who were stripped of their rights. Same thing with, with Disney. You know, uh, Disney produces the garments, some of its garments in Haiti. We're going to, we have a nice little surprise for Disney with one of its sweatshops in Africa, but we'll leave that for later. But Disney makes these garments, uh, made these garments, the 101 Dalmatian and the Pocahontas, made them in, in, in Haiti, and where the workers lived in, in utter misery. And we were asked by the workers to come to their homes. They, they said to us, we think it would really surprise you. And we said, of course we'll go. We'll do anything that you want us to because we want to take your struggle back to the people of the United States. And uh, we're in this little hut, and it's like maybe 10 by 12. And there's no windows. It's, it's mud and stone walls with a car graded roof, scrap metal, and one light bulb hanging down, one bare light bulb. And I'll, I'll never forget it. Like, we're crushed into the room, and there's nothing there. I'm standing in the room, and I'm looking around, and I realize there's no refrigerator, there's no fan, there's no toys, there's no clothing, there's no water, there's nothing. There was one kitchen table and two cots. And I said to the woman, well, where do you get your water? She worked for the Disney company making this clothing. She said, well, we have to buy it in buckets down the block, and we need uh, six buckets a day at eight cents a bucket. 48 cents a day. That was more than she came home with after making clothing for Walt Disney. She didn't even have enough money to buy water for her kids. I said, oh, where's the bathroom? She takes me outside and it's a hole in the ground that the family share, literally just that, a hole in the ground. We go back inside and her children were there and they were laying on the cots and I, they didn't look good. And I said to her, how are they? What's, what are they doing home? And uh, Haiti of all countries was forced by, you know, the IMF and the, the, that bunch to privatize its, its primary education. So, 
they have to have money to go to school. And she didn't have money to, to have them go to school, so the kids are in school two weeks, they're out two weeks, they're in school a week. Whenever they can afford it, they go back to school. The children were sick. One had dysentery, the other malaria. She had no money for medicines. There was no food. I said to them, what are you going to eat tonight? And she says, nothing. We frequently go to bed hungry. Out of these discussions, the worker said to us, do you think that we could approach the Walt Disney Company for a 58 cent an hour wage? They're making 28 cents an hour. And we felt like saying to them, come on, this is the Disney Company. Don't ask, it's 58 cents. Well, they were very modest, very realistic. They said, no, no, we're a very poor country. If we could get 58 cents an hour, we can put food on, that, on the table for our families two or three nights a week. For us, that would be an, an amazing step forward. May not be much to you, but for us, it would be a great deal. Well, when we approached the Disney Company uh, with the workers' request, I, we were told to get lost, to go to hell, we must be out of our minds. I, the 28 cent wage is a good wage. In fact, the guy who actually was in charge of producing the clothing, a company called H.H. Cutler, he said, look, they're alive, aren't they? Must be a living wage. So this is the kind of mentality, this is what you're dealing with. So we went back to El Salvador, uh, to Haiti with the garment, and it was $19.99, 101 Dalmatian garment. We, we talked to the workers and we found out what the piece rate was for every single operation. And I, I forget now, I think it was like 13 steps to assemble it. Went down like in 11 pieces. There were 13 steps to assemble it. The total wages in the Disney garment was six cents. Six, cent, six cents of wages in a $19.99 garment. In other words, three tenths of 1% of the retail price of the garment. If Disney doubled the wages, it would have no impact on the price of the garment whatsoever. Zero, it would be 12 cents of wages in a, in a $20 garment, nothing. Well, that doesn't have much impact on Michael Eisner, who last year paid himself $177 million, compensation and wages and all the rest. That's $3.4 million a week, $104,000 an hour. So Michael Eisner pays himself $104,000 an hour and pays the workers in Haiti 28 cents. It's slavery just like was said earlier. And they, they tell us that the marketplace is the best allocator of resources. And how dare you talk about a living wage or subsistence wages. You know, when PVH, uh, Phils Van Usen, shut down the only unionized factory in all of Guatemala, which they did last Christmas, right before the Christmas holiday, Phils Van Usen owned a factory in Guatemala. It was the only unionized factory and it had to be destroyed because the workers were making a dollar nine cents an hour. And they were afraid that would spread around Guatemala. So PVH, they're on the president's task force for human rights and worker rights. PVH shuts the factory down, throws the workers in the street, and then sources the work out to factories that are paying 36 cents to 50 cents an hour, where there are miners working and where there's forced overtime. And they get a pat on the back from the White House for their human rights work. The minute that Klatsky was throwing the workers out, he's the CEO of, of PVH, he gave himself a $700,000 bonus. And I looked into his financial uh, records. You know, these people don't even pay for their kids to go to school. He gets $71,000 a year grant from the company to send his little kiddies to college. He makes $2.6 million a year, you think he could afford it. And they don't even pay co-payments for health. It's unbelievable what these people do. He took another thirty dollars or $40,000 in co-payments for his whole family for their, health, for their health maintenance. And they throw these workers out because they were making a dollar, a dollar nine an hour. Well, I, I went into uh, the Sports Authority not that long ago, and I bought this Yankee Blazer jersey in honor of them winning the World Series. And I look inside and it says, Made in Burma. Now, you know better than I, I know there's tremendous activism. People, you know, people have done enormously fantastic work here, which is spread all across the country. You know better than I do that the place is a concentration camp, that the military, you know, really solidified their power in 1988 when they gunned down thousands of people on the street who were marching for the right to vote and for democracy, students, union people. And now the country is run by a vicious military dictatorship that keeps the people in line through terror, rape, torture, ethnic cleansing, murder, uh, you name it. In Burma, you go to prison for 20 years for criticizing the military dictators. You'll go to jail for 15 years for having a fax machine under the science law. And it is a concentration camp. President Clinton 
did one good thing. He said, let's stop all new U.S. investments in Burma until the military thugs are out. No new U.S. investments. That was May of 1997. Strange thing happened. The U.S. apparel companies in 1998 increased their imports from Burma by 44%. What sanctions? They laughed in his face and they increased the imports by 44% to $110 million a year. Why were the U.S. companies in Burma? Well, they could pay six cents an hour, the lowest wages in the world. Eight dollars a month for a six hour work week. And it even gets better because the military is brought into the factories the first hint of any dissatisfaction on the part of the workers. And the workers know that they'll be taken off to prison and tortured. So you don't have a whole lot of dissent in the factories where the U.S. companies really feel at home there. But it gets worse because the military is not stupid. So they don't allow wholly owned foreign subsidiaries. You have to be in a joint venture with guess who? The military or the drug lords. About 90% of the factories are joint ventures with the military dictators, 10% with the drug lords who run 65% of the heroin to the United States. So the U.S. companies are in bed with the military. The money the military makes off the apparel trade, they made $2 billion off of it since 1988. They go to China, purchase weapons, come back and murder and torture their own people. And the U.S. companies say to us, you know, why are you always attacking us? Don't you see the good side, the softer side of Sears and the softer side of, of uh, these companies? Well, I think I'm going to talk about Walmart briefly, because if we're looking at the global economy, the global sweatshop uh, economy, Walmart's the place to begin. Walmart is the largest retailer in the world. It's the largest retailer in Canada, the largest retailer in the United States. They're entering, they've entered Germany, they're entering the United Kingdom now. They're becoming the largest retailer in Mexico. Walmart is the largest private sector employer in the United States. Most people don't know about it. General Motors, of course, used to be the largest employer. At $46 an hour, $26 in wages, 20 in benefits. General Motors is no longer the largest employer in the United States, but it's the largest employer in Mexico, 50 to 65 cents an hour. And we've got now Walmart as the largest employer. Maybe, you know, about $6.10 an hour average wage. And they cap the work week, they attempt to cap the work week at 25 hours so they don't have to pay benefits. That leaves one half of Walmart's employees eligible for food stamps. So the largest employer in the United States on the verge of the millennium, one half of its employees qualify for food stamps. Besides destroying neighborhoods and all the rest and putting uh, small businesses out and destroying downtown areas, Walmart's also the largest sweatshop abuser in the world. Their annual sales, $137.6 billion. That makes Walmart larger than 155 countries in the world, and there are 192. Walmart's annual sales are larger than the gross domestic product, the entire economic, economic output of 155 countries. What does Walmart do with that power? Well, this is Walmart and the World Trade Organization. Walmart uses that power to play these countries off against each other. You want Walmart work? You can have it, but I won't have any unions, and I won't have any regulations, and no occupational health and safety and I won't have any red tape, and I won't have any environmental protections. You know that? I won't have anything. And I want low wages, starvation wages. And Walmart plays countries off against each other. Who's going to give them the best deal? They don't pay a single cent of taxes. For example, in the Kathy Lee uh, label with Walmart, this clothing that was made in, in El Salvador, the entire government revenue in El Salvador is $1.8 billion. The government brings in 1.8 billion in revenues to provide basic needs to 6 million people, over 6 million people. Walmart's annual sales of 137.6 billion means Walmart's revenues are 76 times greater than the entire country of El Salvador, yet Walmart doesn't pay one cent of taxes in those free trade zones. Zero. And in El Salvador and these other countries, you don't even have to be in the free trade zones anymore. They've turned the entire countries into sweatshops. So you can set a factory up anywhere and you don't pay taxes. If you're a multinational, you're going to come in and, and gouge the low wages. You do it scot-free, no tariffs whatsoever. Walmart, we were going around and we'd find things like this, these Kathy Lee blouses. And this is sort of epitomizes the race to the bottom. 
Kathy Lee and Walmart, we always notice a change when we go into the, into the Walmarts. It's as if they chase collapsing currencies in misery. So when we were doing this research, the two big producers were Mexico and Indonesia, both places where the currencies, you know, fell through the, you know, fell through the floor. Well, anyway, these shirts will hang right next to each other. They're exactly the same. Kathy Lee's uh, blouses, $16.96. Cost of one small difference. One was made in the United States, $8.42 an hour, $1.70 of labor in this blouse. This blouse was made in Mexico, 50 cents uh, in an hour of wages, 17 cents of labor in the blouse. Yet they both cost the exact same thing. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that these jobs are going here very fast. You'd have to be an idiot to stay here and pay, you know, so much more. And in fact, in the last year, in the United States, we've lost 475,000 manufacturing jobs. Well, what kind of a, a company is Walmart? People remember maybe back in 1992 when NBC, Dateline, went with a nun to Bangladesh and the nun took them through the factory and they had hidden cameras. And they found children nine years old to 12 years old on three floors in the factory making clothing for Walmart shirts. The kids were paid five to eight cents an hour and they worked until midnight and if they made mistakes, the kids told the nun they hit us and they punched us. They took the tapes back to, to David Glass, the CEO of Walmart in, in uh, Bentonville, Arkansas, and they showed him the tapes. And he looked at the tapes and he said, these images don't mean a thing to me. You and I define child labor differently. They took the tape back to, to, uh, to Bangladesh and they showed it to the factory owner who had been working under contract with Walmart for over a year. He looks at the tape and he looks up at them and he says, no, 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 no. He said, you have it all wrong. You only think though, that those are children. They're really malnourished adults. So this is the moral fiber of the World Trade Organization and the corporations. You only think they're children, but it's different. They're really malnourished adults. We recently found Walmart in a factory called Beximco in Bangladesh where they were paying the workers 20 cents an hour. They're supposed to earn 33 cents an hour. They were paying them 20 cents an hour. They were forcing them to work seven days a week from 7.30 in the morning until 8 o'clock at night. Overtime is supposed to be double time. So if it was 33 cents, they're supposed to be getting 66 cents an hour. Walmart paid 20 cents an hour and paid overtime and straight time, the same 20 cents. For an 80-hour work week, they pay the workers $16. They're supposed to earn $36. Walmart, the largest, most profitable retail in the world, is stealing $20 a week from some of the poorest people in the world. That's how they make their money. And yet Walmart's operating profit last year was $7.6 billion, and the Walton family is worth $67.5 billion. But they have to cheat the people in Bangladesh of a 33 cent wage or 60 cent, 66 cent wage with overtime. Again, there's enormous greed through the system. About a month ago, a bunch of people were killed in another fire in Bangladesh because they're locked in the factories, there's metal grates on the windows, there's no fire escapes, no fire extinguishers, and the women bashed through the grates. They were up on the third or fourth floor. They tried to tie some of the the clothing together and go out and the rope collapsed. Five were killed and 50 were seriously injured. 14-year-olds and 15-year-olds making clothing for the U.S. companies. Well, I think uh, you know about Saipan. This is a beautiful scheme. The, this is really what the World Trade Organization uh, would applaud, I think. Uh, in Saipan, the American companies figured out, well, look, at this place is the U.S. territory. What good is it? Let's figure out what we can use it for. So a U.S. territory, but it's not covered by immigration law. It's not covered by minimum wage law, but it's U.S. territory. So the U.S. companies figured out that they could take their partners from China, have them relocate their factories to Saipan, and they could put on the clothing made in the USA. Send it back to the United States so you'd buy a piece of clothing that said made in the United States, but of course it was made in Saipan in the territory. It was made by workers paid $2.15 below the U.S. minimum wage. It was made by workers locked in factories 12 and 14 hours a day. And how the scheme worked, they sent recruiters to, to China where they recruited 15,000 young women a year, bring them to Saipan. They were told they were coming to the United States, they'd get good jobs, high wages, good living conditions. They only had to pay $5,000 as a recruitment fee, which of course they couldn't pay, they'd have to work off. So the women came to Saipan, little did they know, they're locked in factories and locked in dormitories. When they got there, they charged them $200 a month for room and board. 
So if you add it up, it's $5,000 recruitment fee, $2,400 a year for room and board. That's $7,400. Well, if the women were making $3 an hour, which they were, and if they're working 45 hour work week, they could not even pay their debt off if they worked every single day for the entire year. In other words, two things are obvious. They weren't working 45 hours a week, they were working seven days a week, and they're working 12 to 14 hours a day, not eight hours a day. The second thing that's obvious is that they were indentured servants because they took them the whole period to pay off their debt to the recruiters and to the companies. And it, get even, it gets even worse in that the workers had to sign what, what they call the shadow contract. And if they, were, if they became pregnant, they would be fired and deported. If they fell in love or got married or attempted to get married, they'd be fired and deported. If they wouldn't work the overtime, they'd be fired and deported. If they criticized working and living conditions, they'd be fired and deported. If they wouldn't lie to inspectors that came in, to the factories or to the dorms, they would be fired and deported. It got so disgusting that if they became involved in religious activities which would drain their energies from work, they would be fired and deported. And of course, they'd be sent back to China in enormous debt that they could never pay off. And of, and of course, they would suffer any kind of retaliation that the recruiters wanted to bring against them because they were working hand in glove with the government. Walmart produces in Saipan, in a factory called Mirage, they're in the same factory with The Gap and with J. Crew and The Limited. Well, I want to talk briefly about my friend Kathy Lee Gifford, because I can't leave her out of this. Uh, I, that, a few years ago, when she was crying on television and threatening to sue me, uh, if you remember, she was shedding these crocodile tears, and she was waving a letter I had written to her. And she was saying, Mr. Sit by your telephone. You're going to get a call from my attorney. You can say I'm ugly. You can say I can't sing. You can say I can't act. All of it true. But don't dare say that I don't love little kitties. And Mr. Sit by your telephone. So I, explain, I can explain the background. We were in, uh, in Honduras, and young women approached us, and they said, would you meet with us? We have a lot of problems at our factory. And we do the same thing like we always do, we, we meet in a clandestine place, a safe house. In this case, it was a food stand about 100 yards away from the factory. The owner is a supporter of human rights. He's always let us meet there. We're safe. So he said that to the woman. Go on down to the food stand. There's a big fence. We'll meet behind the fence. The meeting's about to start during lunch, lunch break. Just as we're going to start the meeting, three young guys walk in. And the women point to the three guys and they say, these guys are spies. And every single thing we say will go right back to the boss. We can't meet. And it was a very tense confrontation with these, these, these guys. Well, what the women did, they, they started to file out, and they started putting their hands underneath an old table I was standing next to. And I realized they're trying to give me something. So I put my hand under the table, and sure enough, they were putting into my palm their pay stubs. So we would know how much they got paid, who they were, and the labels that they made in the factory. So we would know their names, the pay, the labels. And when they walked out, and I took my hand out, from underneath, this, this was the label I had, Kathy Lee Gifford. These were the pants they made. They were paid 25 cents for every $19.96 pair of Kathy Lee pants they made for Walmart and for Kathy Lee. I just happened to have a blow up of Kathy Lee Gifford. She doesn't appreciate this. I don't know why, but I, this has upset Frank too. We'll come back to him. Well, she has, uh, she's happy, and she's got a lot of teeth. And the bottom of it says, a portion of the proceeds from the sale of this garment will be donated to various children's charities. It's very touching. Before anybody weeps, this, this, these are the workers. They leave out the tiny uh, fact that it was children that were making the clothing. So Kathy Lee Gifford's pants was being made in Honduras by 13, 14, and 15 year olds. And somehow they're telling us, if we buy these pants, we're going to be helping little kitties in the United States. But you cannot do it on the backs of children in Honduras who are paid 31 cents an hour and treated uh, like slaves. When we, when we uh, put that out and Kathy Lee was crying and threatening to sue and everything, we found out that she did have a foundation, but it wasn't quite Paul Newman type foundation, that uh, in fact she did contribute money she made $9 million a year off of selling her name to, Wal to Walmart, and 10% uh, went to the kiddies and 90% to Kathy Lee. 90% to Kathy Lee, 10% to the kiddies. When they found out that we knew, we never heard again about a lawsuit.
But Primetime Live came in, they wanted to do a cover-up, a puff piece on Kathy Lee, same network, and they say to me, Kathy Lee says, why should we believe you that children work in the factory? So I gave them a smaller version of this picture. And I got a call back two or three hours later, an hour and a half later, and they said, Kathy Lee looked at the picture and threw it aside and said, these people could be anybody, they're nobodies. Well, they didn't know we were setting them up because at that very moment, this young girl was on a plane to the United States when Kathy Lee was going with the mouth that they're nobodies. <laughs> Wendy Diaz was on a plane coming to the United States and she was 13 years old when she started to work in the factory. She worked the 12 hour shifts making the Kathy Lee pants. She was 15 years old when she came to the United States. She had a third grade education. She had never traveled before. We had a fight for her visa, fight for her passport. She's on a plane coming to the United States and the human rights group calls me Kode and they say she's on the plane. She's been accompanied by Esperanza Reyes, who's in my opinion like a real hero, a, a tremendous uh, women's rights leader with Kode, the Committee for Defense of Human Rights. And everything's all set, they say. And they say to me, by the way, this kid doesn't talk. And I got really upset over the phone. I said, what do you mean she doesn't talk? What, why are you sending someone who doesn't talk? She's going to be interviewed by the New York Times. She's going to be on the radio and television. She's going to testify in Congress. Why are you sending someone who doesn't talk? Well, they said, I don't know. We couldn't get her to talk. When she came to the United States, the only reason she hadn't spoken was no one had taken her seriously before. No one had asked her opinion. No one had spoken with her seriously, listened to her. No one was interested in her opinion. When she came to the United States, she was so full of courage and so full of dignity that her, it took her and brilliance. It took her two weeks to demolish Kathy Lee Gifford and Walmart to the point I felt sorry for Walmart and I was going to pull little Wendy off of them. She was cleaning them. I mean, we did congressional hearings. No one, I, we went, this is, I, I, I never talk about this, but when the, when Rice spoke, I was thinking about it. We were out at, we were doing congressional hearings in front of like Ray Burner Cannon, I forget which building. And we got there, Wendy, myself, Esperanza Reyes and Barbara Briggs from my office. And we were real nervous because we had heard that the Republicans were gonna try to get us. These were official hearings held by the Republicans. And a woman named Desqua Debbie was in charge of uh, pulling together the hearings. She used to work for Helms. And she, she got the nickname Desqua Debbie because she was a major player with the Contras, raising money for the Contras. She left the United States and she married a right-wing general in Honduras. But this case was so big, they brought Desqua Debbie back from Honduras so she could work all her congressional contacts in the Congress. So we knew we were walking into a fierce fight. And uh, we were afraid to go in. So we, we stayed outside and tried to just talk to each other. And we're standing, it's a very gloomy day. And we're standing there and all of a sudden, the sky opens up a little bit and a ray of light comes right through and hits uh, Wendy. And we're all standing there like that. And our eyes, we are like shocked. Well, we go into the place and she just wiped them out, completely demolished. All of the pinstripe suits were there from Honduras. They had business people, members of the government. She cleaned the ground with them to the point where uh, Republicans were saying back to these, these business people from, from Honduras that little Wendy is doing more to protect jobs and dignity in Honduras than all you people put together. Come back and see us when you're serious. And these people were like really nervous after those hearings, but that's the impact this kid had. It was extraordinary. Well, I'm in a cab in New York City, coming back from a meeting, I hear beep, 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 beep. Kathy Lee Gifford's gonna meet with Wendy Diaz in the National Labor Committee. So I knew we were meeting, I heard about it on the radio. So I go back to my office, and sure enough, I get a call. Now, at this particular moment, they had taken duct tape and put it around Kathy Lee's mouth because she wasn't doing so good, and they hired Howard Rubenstein, the biggest PR firm in New York. They run entire governments. So I get a call from the PR firm, and they say, will you meet? And I say, of course we'll meet, very anxious to meet. And the guy says, well, where do you want to meet? And I said, a church. And he screams over the thing, uh, what the hell do you want to meet in a church for? And I wasn't going to explain this to him, but. We have a big name, the National Labor Committee, but we have a staff of four people. So we never let anybody into our office because it's all smoke and mirrors. And so what we do is we meet in churches and find out the companies feel very nervous in church. And I met with Walmart in a, in a progressive uh, church in Greenwich Village, and I noticed they're always looking over their shoulders and they get very nervous and it makes them think that we have some very powerful friends on our side and they don't like it. So we continue to do this, but this was my mistake because I found out that Kathy Lee 
uh, was good friends with Cardinal O'Connor. So we met in a church, but it was St. Patrick's Cathedral, and it wasn't the small activist churches I was thinking of. So the day of the meeting comes around, and uh, we were meeting like on a Wednesday morning. And sure enough, we get to the meeting, and sure enough, we're terrified again. We hadn't seen, we'd never met Kathy Lee Gifford. We didn't know what she looked like in real life. And we didn't, we didn't know what to expect. So we hit across the street, like we always do. So we're on 51st Street, and we're looking at the Cardinals residency, and Wendy's much smaller than I am. We're looking around the corner of the building. She's looking around, I'm looking around. Sure enough, Kathy Lee comes, and they don't go anywhere alone, these rich people. A whole entourage comes. Public relations people, lawyers, company people, and since she cries a lot, someone carries Kleenexes. Well, they go in to the meeting, and we build up our courage, and we go in. And my first remark was, my first feelings was, you know, how nice the Cardinal lived. It was a very, it was a tremendous apartment. And uh, the furniture was, was uh, big, and they put me right next to Kathy Lee Gifford, who was on a couch, and I'm on a rocking chair. And I was nervous to begin with, but I, I, once I got in the rocking chair, I couldn't stop it from rocking. My feet were barely touching the ground. I'm rocking back and forth, and I'm staring at Kathy Lee Gifford. I can't take my eyes off her. I'm rocking back and forth, looking at her. And I look around the room, and other people are staring at her, and Wendy is staring at her. Wendy was like, her eyes are bulging, and she's staring at Kathy Lee. And I asked her afterwards, what were you looking at? And what it turned out is Kathy Lee had come right from her set, her TV program. And if you're not used to seeing these people, they wear so much makeup that it's startling. I mean, it's about like a half an inch thick. You can't see a line or an expression. And she looked like she was embalmed. And it was scary to me. Wendy had never seen anything like it in her life, and she was going to get up and bolt and run out of there. I mean, it was like pretty frightening stuff. But eventually, we got control of the rocking chair, and the meeting starts. And Kathy Lee says to Wendy, Wendy, tell me about your life. You know, that she's really interested in. We had heard uh, one of the things that they were thinking of doing, uh, Kathy Lee and Frank, was to uh, buy Wendy and adopt her. Because if you buy her, buy her, you can shut her up. So we crush that in two seconds. But so the meeting starts, and they say, uh, oh, Wendy, tell me about your life. And I'm sitting there praying to myself, Wendy, don't fall for it. Don't start talking, oh, Kathy Lee, you're so beautiful, and New York is so spectacular, and Honduras is so poor, and we've got dirt roads. Wendy didn't fall for it. She looked right back at Kathy Lee Gifford. And without bat an eyelash, in rapid succession, she told Kathy Lee what it was like to live in one room with 11 people. She told Kathy Lee what it was like to earn 31 cents an hour and frequently go to bed hungry because you don't have the money to buy enough food with. She told Kathy Lee Gifford what you felt like when they pick up the garments and throw them in your face in the factory because they say you made a mistake or you're not going fast enough and they curse at you and call you a chicken head. She told Kathy Lee Gifford what you felt like when you couldn't go to the bathroom and your body hurt because they limited it to once in the morning, once in the afternoon and how humiliated you felt and, how pain, and what kind of pain it actually was. And she told Kathy Lee Gifford what it was like to come out of work at 9 o'clock at night in a pitch darkness in a poor area with no public transportation when you gather together with the other little, little kids and you run home together, whistling and singing because you're afraid you're going to be raped or assaulted. And you hang out together and run home for protection. When she finished, Kathy Lee Gifford became a human being for 15 seconds and apologized to Wendy. It was a remarkable scene. She leaned over this Hollywood personality and she said, please believe me. I didn't know. I had no idea. And now that I know I'm going to work with you, I'm going to work with these other people, I will never allow it to happen again. That night we signed an agreement with Kathy Lee Gifford that she would never again tolerate sweatshops, that her factories around the world would be open to independent inspection by religious labor rights and human rights leaders to guarantee compliance with human rights and labor rights, and that workers around the world should be paid a living wage so they and their families could live in dignity. She signed that last part because I don't think she knew what it was, living wage. But, you know, I, I, if, I, I doubt many people here read the Enquirer. I did an interview with them. At first I thought I was being interviewed by the Philadelphia Enquirer. Then the, the questions became weirder and weirder. And, and I realized this is a different newspaper. But anyway, they've just put out, they just put out uh, like a two-page uh, story on, on Kathy Lee Gifford, which was really quite interesting. They compared the mansions that the Giffords have, a $5 million mansion in Greenwich, Connecticut, million dollar apartment in New York, million dollar Palm, Palm Beach thing in Florida, and, and Aspen, Colorado, with the homes of the workers in El Salvador that make the Kathy Lee pants. And they compared the lives of the, of the children in, in Salvador, of the mothers making the clothing, 
with, uh, with uh, Cody and Cassidy, those two uh, things that she's always talking about on television. Anyway, it's very interesting. They spend $36 a week on dog food, and the family in, in El Salvador is trying to live on, on uh, these starvation wages. Well, uh, at any rate, uh, the, at the meeting was ending, and, and Kathy Lee tried to make one last attempt to get us all to cry, and I knew it was coming because they're passing the Kleenexes out. And I, I got a few of them. And then Kathy Lee says to little Wendy, she says, Wendy, Wendy, do you know how sad it was for me when my two little kids come to me and say to me, Mommy, Mommy, why is everybody saying such bad things about you on television? And she expected us all to burst into tears. Nobody cried, the clean was collected, and the meeting was over. But nothing really changed. Not long after that, we found these Kathy Lee pocketbooks made in China. The same hand tag, you buy this pocketbook, you can help the little kitties. Well, they again leave out the fact that young women in China make the pocketbooks, forced to work 10 hours a day, seven days a week, they pay them 12 and a half cents an hour. So obviously that's $1.25 a day, $8.75 for the week. But they house in the dormitories and they take out $5.41. That leaves them with $3.44 after a 70 hour work week making pocketbooks for Kathy Lee Gifford. And we're to believe that that exploitation in China is going to help little kitties in the United States. It's incredible lies on the part of Walmart and Kathy Lee. These are the dormitories. 16 people will be stuffed into a room. Army bunk beds will be pushed up against each other. And in these thin bunk beds, there'll be two people, two women, on each level of the bunk bed. And they hang up cardboard and cloth for privacy. In the mornings, they're fed a thin rice gruel and in, for lunch and supper, stir-fried vegetables. But don't think that Wal Walmart and the other U.S. companies aren't human, because they are. When the workers work past midnight, the next day they get a special treat. They get the rice gruel and bread. To, so you've got to hand it to them. It's not, uh, you know, they, there's parts of them that are human. It's not just uh, Walmart either, it's more. This Teletubby I carry around it's the Teletubby, of course, Jerry Falwell uh, attacked viciously because said it was gay. Now, he's certainly off the wall, this guy. But there is a story behind the Teletubby. Uh, and that story is, of course, it, like all toys, was made in China. And the Teletubby is the largest selling toy in the United States. One billion dollars the American people spent on the Teletubbies. One billion. It's made in China by young women 17 to 25 years of age. They work. It's a factory called Door Lock. They work 16 hours a day, seven days a week. They work from 7 o'clock in the morning until 1 o'clock at night. They're allowed four hours of sleep. They get a half a day off a month, which is payday. That's their break. They're paid 13 cents an hour. So for the 112-hour week, they get paid $14.42. But they take out $2.40 for dome expenses, so it ends up leaving them with $12.02 for 112 hours of work. This Ellen Tracy uh, garment, it's $155, made in China. The workers who made it got paid 23 cents an hour. You talk about the mock-ups. 23 cents an hour, and they work from 7.30 in the morning until 11 o'clock at night. This lapel pin I carried around, can't get anybody interested in it. The media doesn't think it's a story. This lapel pin was made for the Republican National Committee. And they interviewed the owner of the company. He was like entrepreneur, small business entrepreneur of the year. And they asked him, how do you do it? You know, this stuff's very competitive. You gotta, you gotta paint and you're hand polishing. Anyway, uh, this guy made a mistake. And he told the truth to a small business magazine, which someone then sent me. He said, I'll tell you how I do it. They sold 250,000 of these to the Republicans. He said, I'll tell you how I do it to the Republican Party. I have a factory in China. I have 250 workers. I own them. That's a direct quote. They work from 7 o'clock in the morning until 11 o'clock at night. They live 16 to a room. I pay them 9 cents an hour, and they're mostly little girls from the countryside. So little girls from the countryside work until 11 o'clock at night and paid 9 cents an hour are making these lapel pins, but that's not a story. No one's interested in it. I'm going to... I want to talk, let's see, if I could just tell one last story about Walmart, and then I'm going to finish. Um, Walmart is a very patriotic company. 
Like if this is, uh, again, very interesting. If you go into the Walmarts, the flags and the banners and bring it home to the USA, made right here, proud of our neighbors who made these, uh, these products, support American manufacturers that support American jobs. This intrigued me a lot because Walmart was actually saying, if that was true, that they wouldn't enter the race to the bottom, that they wouldn't chase nine cent wages around the world, that there were standards below which they wouldn't go. Human rights standards, women rights standards, labor rights standards, wage standards below which they wouldn't go. So I called Walmart and I said, well, I'm interested in your Buy America policy. How many of your goods are actually made in the United States? And uh, there was this stupid silence on the other side of the phone and they said, uh, 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 you know, the, oh, we can't tell you, we don't know, they said. Which of course is stupid, they have the largest private data bank in the world, they monitor every single product in the Walmarts. So I figured, once again, uh, something's going on here. So we decided to go into Walmart and start counting clothing. And I wouldn't advise this to anybody, I spent an entire summer doing it. Uh, <laughs> you lose a lot of gray matter. And when we first started, we went in to the stores with notebooks. And we were going around the store and we would be counting, oh, look at this, we were writing it down. Found out you couldn't write in Walmarts against the law. There are even a hidden cameras, it looks out of control, but there are hidden cameras and you're immediately escorted out of the store. You cannot write in a notebook in Walmart. Then we started taking photographs and you couldn't do that either. It was worse than the Exmodica factory in El Salvador. They wanted to film too, it was the same thing. Only they didn't have armed guards and they didn't beat us up or anything, but they would scream and yell, taking pictures in Walmart makes us very nervous. Well, we found out that you could do, uh, you could act pretty weird in Walmart and no one would say a single thing. So we discovered how to do our research. We used hidden tape recorders, voice activated tape recorders, and I spent the entire summer in Walmart talking aloud to myself. And so I would go into Kathy Lee Gifford's clothing and I'd go, oh, look at this, blouses from Indonesia. One, two, 32 blouses, $18. Oh, look at these dresses from Malaysia. One, two, three. And we did this the entire summer. We'd leave on a Friday night and we would go to a Walmart, camp clothing for two or three hours, go to the hotel, transcribe the tapes. That was even more boring get in the car the next day, do three Walmarts on a Saturday, transcribe the tape Saturday night, back to a Walmart Sunday morning, and start all over again. And one Sunday morning, I was in a, a Lancaster, Pennsylvania, in a super center, where there are lots of flags and everything, and I was completely exhausted. And it's nine o'clock in the morning, and I'm in the Kathy Lee section, I'm counting dresses and blouses. And now, admittedly, that looks pretty weird. What is this man doing nine o'clock in the morning, counting blouses in the women's section? And a mother was there with her two kids, and they're looking at me, and uh, one of the kids started walking towards me, and the mother screams, stay away from that man. And she grabs him by the arm and yanks him away. And I felt like saying, lady, this is serious research, you know? One day they'll write about this stuff in the universities, you know? But I, helped, I kept my mouth shut. That's the other danger of the work is uh, my bag. I travel a lot, but it's filled with all the sweatshop clothing. I, I can only carry like two shirts for myself but my bags are all full of women's clothing and toys. And when you go through these airports, especially internationally, I'm always nervous. They, that, they always check my, my thing for gunpowder and everything, because I look so nervous when I'm going through these, uh, these uh, detectors and everything. Well, this, uh, this uh, project with the tape recorders, we ended up counting 105,000 items in Walmart. 86,600 pieces of clothing and 17% were made in the United States, 83% were made offshore. We counted 16,245 pairs of shoes, and only 16 shoes were made in the United States. Not 16%, 16 pairs of shoes, that was no doubt a mistake. 1,910 handbags and pocketbooks, zero, were made in the United States. Kathy Lee clothing, 11% in the United States, 89% offshore. Faded Glory men's clothing, 13% in the U.S., 87% offshore. McKids children's clothing, 4% in the U.S., 96% offshore. Walmart was flat out lying to the American people. So we thought about suing them. I figured they're always trying to sue us. We're going to turn around and sue Walmart for lying to the American people, false advertising. So we started to research their documents and we found it. In black and white, Walmart had an unprecedented commitment to purchase American made goods. And we clapped with joy until we saw the small print. Walmart has an unprecedented commitment to purchase American made goods whenever they can meet the pricing available offshore. So if you find someone that worked for nine cents an hour in the United States, Walmart will buy your goods. So they had a loophole. But, uh, you know, this is how phony these companies are. And what they're about 
is really the race to the bottom. And I'll end with this. Uh, these two pair of jeans, I think, tell a story. They were hanging right next to each other in the department store. They're 100% the same, Britannia jeans. It's a, uh, owned by the VF now, one of the most miserable uh, apparel companies, a real sweatshop abuser. $17.99, both of them. One difference, one was made in the United States, the other was made in Nicaragua. In the United States, everything is by piece rate. A worker gets 15 minutes, workers get 15 minutes to assemble a pair of pants. At $8.42 an hour, there's $2.08 of labor in this pants made in the United States. That's 11.5% of the retail price of the garment is in labor. That's typical. It's always like 10% in that area when a, when a product's made in the United States. 10% of the cost is in labor. In this case, 11.5%. When they take the work out of the United States, all they do is translate the piece rate into the local currency. It sounds like rocket science, but it's not. If it's 100 pieces in the United States for $8.31 an hour, when they take the work offshore, it now becomes 100 pieces for 23 cents an hour. That's the great translation of the, of the business people. Well, but they're not inhuman. This is a, a real science of exploitation. They look at the 23 cent an hour wages in Nicaragua and they say, wait a second. Those people, uh, they're malnourished. Give them more time. Take 5% off the piece rate. Oh, wait a second. It's 100 degrees in the factory. They're exhausted. Take 5% more off the piece rate. Let's give these workers more time. Oh, they work in 12-hour shifts? Oh, that's hard. Let's give them a little bit more time. Take 5% off the piece rate again. So in Nicaragua, the U.S. companies give them a full 33% more time. They give them 20 minutes to make a pair of jeans. 20 minutes to make the jeans. In this pair of jeans, there's 14 cents of labor. They've taken the labor of $2.08, 11.5% of the garment. They've wiped it out to 14 cents or 8 tenths of 1% of the retail price of the garment. On every single pair of jeans they would take out of the United States, they'd save $1.93. In this factory in Nicaragua, there's 800 workers making 14,000 pairs of jeans, which means they save $27,000 a day, $162,000 a week, or $8.4 million for the year. That's one label in one factory, and companies like Walmart have a thousand factories in China alone where there are multiple labels. And you begin to understand where their, where their profits come from. And of course, uh, the workers' rights were denied. Under the World Trade Organization, under the system as it exists now, which they want to nail into place and extend, corporations want the American people to believe that misery and poverty around the world gives them a license to exploit people, which is a concept that we have to smash completely if we're ever to remake the economy with the human face. Countries, companies right now are completely free to roam the world in search of misery. That's what they do, because you'll find the lowest wages there. Then they can take the American people or people anywhere in the world and pit them against each other in this race to the bottom. Who will accept the lowest wages, the least benefits, the most miserable living and working conditions just for the honor of having a job? There's not one single multinational company that will sit down at the table to discuss linking trade to human rights or worker rights, to women's rights, to environmental protections, not one. They say that's an impediment on free trade. Well, I think what you're doing here in Seattle is like we said earlier, one of the most important fights you can have. No country, no company should get an unfair trade advantage through hiring children, through firing pregnant women, through firing and blacklisting trade unionists, through paying starvation wages, through locked bathrooms. No company or country should get a competitive advantage on the basis of that repression. If China enters the World Trade Organization, It'll be an enormous step backwards for human rights. In China, if you try to meet to discuss factory conditions, you're fired and thrown out, if you're even seen discussing factory conditions. If you form an independent union in China, you're going to be put into a psychiatric ward, or you're going to be put into hard labor for three years under administrative detention without a trial. And the same goes for religious organizations, or women's organizations, or human rights organizations. When we were in China, there was a strike and the way the strikes take place in China is the workers just stop working. They can't have a banner, they can't talk, they can't shout, no slogans. They just stop working. And the military and the police show up and they throw barricades up around the factory so the disease doesn't spread. 
Then they go in and they interview the workers one by one, and when they think they've pinpointed the organizers, they, of course, get fired and thrown out. The rest of the workers are fined, and they go back to work. It's a frightening place. I was completely uh, blown away. Motorola has invested $1.2 billion in China. You go past the GM plant and you drive past it for about 10 minutes out of Shang outside of Shanghai. 10 years ago, it was rice paddies. Now there is a General Motors plant is as big as you can't even imagine it. And shop plants, one after another, after another, after another, making all the microwave ovens. And the disparity in wealth in China now is greater than it is in the United States. The top 20% of the people control 55.3% of the wealth. Their Mercedes Benz is everywhere. The bureaucrats are doing just great. They go around in big, sleek, black Mercedes Benzes. The one child policy doesn't apply, one child per family doesn't apply to the bureaucrats. You go to a hotel, $120 a night, and these people are in there with five and six kids, putting them each in an individual room. There's an enormous amount of money there, and yet the workers have nothing. They're paid the 12 and a half cents, the 28 cents. The workers have bicycles, and the bureaucrats have uh, limousines. They're frightening. No freedoms whatsoever. Well, I'm going to end on a, on a good note. This T-shirt was made in El Salvador. It's uh, a Yale T-shirt. And we tracked the workers down and made it. You know, tuition at Yale is $30,000 a year, room and board. The shirt's $14.99. The women were paid three cents to make this shirt in El Salvador. And what's happening across the country, and, and by the way, there's about $1.37 of material in the garment, so you figure out the mock-up and everything. What's happening across the country with the students, and if there are students here, your movement is the most important human and labor rights movement we have today. The other day, if you saw in the Wall Street Journal, they attacked us and they attacked the students. And the thing that the Wall Street Journal was, was angry about the most, it was the lead editorial, uh, Friday, I think, last Friday, was the fact that the students were opposing the World Trade Organization. That made the Wall Street Journal go livid. They went completely nuts. If you haven't seen it, you sh uh, I have a copy. We'll, we'll, we'll send it to people. The White House is calling United Students Against Sweatshops and asking for meetings. I mean, it is amazing power that you've got right now. The companies don't know how to deal with you. The administration doesn't know how to deal with you. The biggest nightmare a company has, a multinational, is when young people ask serious questions. Where did these garments come from? Who made them? How old were they? Was it a living wage? What conditions did they live under? The minute you start challenging these companies, they wet their pants. They can't take it. You know, they got a whole public relations thing uh, geared up against the unions. And I've watched this for years. If a union comes and says, this company's using child labor, this company's violating the rights of the workers, the company says to the media, oh, come on, what do you think that union's going to do? They're paid to attack us. That's their job. Congratulations. That's their job. If they didn't attack us, they'd be fired. And besides, you can't believe a thing they say because they're antagonists in the story. We'll grant you that. But you can't believe them. And they get away with that. The six, $650 million advertising budget for Nike goes a long way. Well. When students come and ask those same questions, the whole public relations propaganda machinery of the companies collapses and falls to the knees, and they're completely panic-stricken. Right now, the students, in my mind, are in the driver's seat of this entire movement. And it's an enormous opening that you have, but it also comes with enormous responsibility. And just finally, when uh, we did this last Kathy Lee story, they try to crash our press conferences to upset them. So we did a press conference in New York and one in Washington. In the Washington press conference, we're on the plane leaving New York, the shuttle to go to Washington. And I'm sitting there and I look up, I'm writing notes, and I look up and down the aisle is coming this guy, Robert Adler, who actually makes the Kathy Lee Gifford label. And behind him is Frank Gifford, Kathy Lee's husband. And I think to myself, oh crap, you know, <laughs> gonna be a confrontation on the plane. I don't need this, it's seven o'clock in the morning. I say to the, the Salvadoran women and the union organizer, I say, just keep your heads down, work on the notes, don't look up, and don't leave the plane. We'll be the last to leave. So sure enough, we land in Washington, and we let the whole plane empty out, and I stand up to grab my bag, and who else stayed in the plane but Robert Adler and Frank Gifford, like it was uh, high noon or something. And he, <laughs> he comes over to me, Frank Gifford, and he says, uh, puts his face in my face, and he says, I just want you to know 
that I'm following you around and I'm going to be in your face when you're telling all these lies about my wife. And uh, he was huffing and puffing, trying to be intimidating. And uh, I said to him, have a nice day. And he went outside, he got in line for a cab, and I, we had to get a cab, we went outside, he's glaring at us. Well, we go to the press conference, and of course he crashes into the press conference. And we give him the chance to speak. And he walks up to the microphone, and he comes behind me, and he was trying to elbow me in the back and everything. And he starts crying, too, I mean, this is incredible. And he starts saying, how dare you attack my Kathy? How dare you, she does more for workers around the world than all of you put together. And for children around the world, what about the children? So when he gets done, and he's pointing at me and everything, I say, well, what about the 13-year-old kids in Honduras? You know, what about the 12 and a half cent wages in China? You know, what about the hundreds of thousands of young women locked behind barbed wire, and on, working under armed guards who return to hovels, one room hovels, and raise their kids on coffee because they can't afford food? What about them? You know, they have a problem. I would say that Frank Gifford and Kathy Lee and their two little kids are the less intellectual side of the World Trade Organization. <laughs> but they believe that the war world revolves around them. Well, they, got a, they, they have it a little wrong. It doesn't revolve around them. There are, there are human beings in this world, these hundreds of thousands of young women locked in these factories, and that's where the focus belongs. And I think that's what you're doing here. We can have multiple strategies to go after the World Trade Organization, but the key one of the key approaches is don't let them take the focus off of where it belongs and it belongs on the human face behind that label behind the product the exploitation the, the starvation wages the armed guards that's where the focus belongs not with mad mike yesterday but one one last thing at this press conference i'm listening to this guy adler who makes the kathy lee label he stands up and he says that Kathy Lee is the Joan of Arc of sweatshops, like I mentioned earlier. And I'm asking him questions, and he tells me, well, the pregnancy testing, oh, that's a cultural issue. We can't do anything about it. Pregnancy testing is a cultural issue for El Salvador. Oh, the 60 cent wages, oh, I $1.18 an hour? Oh, he says, I don't know anything about that. You don't have to be an economist. That's a big issue you're talking about. We, that, we, we don't know what you're talking about. Well, he's going on like that, and then Frank Gifford's crying and, and attacking us. And I was watching one of the students who was there with us, Eric Bracken, who's the head of United Students Against Sweatshops. Eric comes over to the podium, and as long as I've done the work, and, and of course we're fairly aggressive going after the companies, but by this time I expect the companies to talk like that. That's the baloney that they say. I, I expect it. I expected Frank Gifford to do that. I didn't expect anything different. Well, Eric and the students are not accepting. And they don't accept that, and they won't accept it. And Eric was standing at the podium, and he started to scream at Frank Gifford and Adler. Gifford left the room, and I was looking at this guy. He looked like a million-dollar bill, beautifully tanned, every hair in place, and he's sitting there like this. And as Eric started yelling at him, you know, not violently or anything, but passionately uh, going after him, I watched his face go from one of, like, complete composure to nervousness. Then he got a little frightened. Then he looked completely confused, and he looked completely out of it. And I realize what's going on here is that there's a new element on the scene, and it's the students. Now, we can run good campaigns, we can do the good research, we can be out there on the streets. The new element is the decency and purity of the students that won't take lies or compromises for an answer. When Eric burst through there with the truth and with the dignity and the call for justice, this guy began to collapse, this Adler guy. And I think that if we, all of us, with the religious people, the labor people, and the students, uh, if we keep going forward, there's no such thing as, as NAFTA written in stone. There's no such thing as the World Trade Organization written in stone. All of it can be demolished, just like Wendy did to, to Walmart. You know, I, I carry these pictures, so I'm going to show them. This is the age of the workers, especially for students here. You'll see they're younger than you are. These are workers in Honduras. This is more of the armed gods. And just how do people live on those wages? This is the house of a woman who made shirts for PVH in El Salvador. Live in one room hovels like this. Yes, yes. Let's uh, maybe, we've got time for questions. 
Charlie, we'll, we'll mm -hmm. raise your hand. Try well, the, it's not U.S. land, but the U, United States government paid to build the sweatshops. I left that out. They funded the, the sweatshops. They gave low interest rate loans at 2% below the prime rate, loans you never could get in Los Angeles or here or New York City. So the U.S. government actually started those free trade, zone, free trade zones under USAID, U.S. Agency for International Development. And they also used U.S. taxpayers' money to form a computerized blacklist to keep unions out of all the factories. I, I just want to interrupt and say that Rice is starting an anti-sweatshop group here. So for any of you who are students on the campus, please yeah. go find them. That's the single most important thing that students could do. One more chapter, their companies are going to start getting a message. Now, the, the, what you're, I mean, really what you have is the biggest thug wins like the Walmart. The one who cuts the corners the most wins. The one who, who scrapes pennies off of people wins. I've been in corporate offices, very plus offices in, in New York, and I was in an apparel company the other day, and I was looking around at the walls, and I was really impressed by how beautiful it was, and the vice president looked at me and said, we may look rich around here, but we kill for pennies. And that's how they run their industries. There are some companies that you can at least speak to. Maybe you speak to a Gap, you speak to a Levi Strauss, it's not that they're doing the right thing, but you can talk to them. Liz Claiborne, you can't talk to a Walmart. No, I've seen kids making, in Honduras, when we first started going there, there were young people, 14 years old, making dockers for starvation wages. And workers in Indonesia working 80 hour weeks, 80 hour weeks making uh, dockers. In other words, it really is. It's a vicious sweatshop system. And you have to move the whole industry. Almost, it, it can't be done company at a time. It has to be a front on the whole industry. Well, that, that's the good. Yeah, wh why do people go into those factories, or how do the how do the free trade zones get them in there? Well, obviously, they're racked by desperate poverty. El Salvador again has 48 percent of the people live in extreme poverty. So. The women want these jobs, they need these jobs. And they've, we've discussed that with them all the time. This isn't a boycott. The women will work 10 hours a day, they'll work hard, they'll do a, a fantastic job, but they want their rights. They know they shouldn't be fondled, they have the right to use the bathroom, they shouldn't be screamed at, they shouldn't be forced over time. The companies take that vulnerability. I mean, you're a single mother, just imagine it. You're a single mother, you're living on a starvation wage, you have several kids dependent upon you, what happens if one of them gets sick and you need to borrow money for penicillin? In other words, you're completely, the company has you. And if you speak up, you're gonna be fired, thrown in the street, and you have no savings on those starvation wages, there's no unemployment insurance, there's no safety net. So they have this enormous power, but the women do need the jobs. And, you know, the elites in those countries and the US companies take complete advantage of it. Well, that was the history of, of uh, the war, I mean, this, the, the war that the U.S. government led throughout Central America. You know, Vietnam it, right now is, is cranking out the Nike sneakers uh, fiercely, 20 million pairs a year. But the Caribbean Basin Initiative, the CBI, which was the precursor to NAFTA, that swept right in after the murderous wars in Central America. And like the gentleman asked, it was a concerted plot. The, the U.S. government funded those free trade zones. And if you would leave the United States, the U.S. government would give you 50% of your worker training money to retrain the workers offshore. They'd give you 100% of your technical needs. It got so bad that they gave you 75% of your travel costs to go look at a sweatshop offshore. If you were a, a corporate board, they paid your flight and your hotel to go look at a sweatshop. Then they gave you a low interest rate loan at 2% below the prime rate. Money that you couldn't get in the United States anywhere. You could only get it if you went to a sweatshop offshore. And we took them up on it. We went with hidden cameras offshore posing as a company. And every single company we went into, US company, we'd go into a company uh, in, uh, called Best Form in Honduras in a free trade zone that was built with US taxpayers' money. And you go into the guy's office and there's the thin glass window and it looks down on the shop floor where the women were sewing women's garments. 
And we say to the owner, he's the American, the manager, we say, how is it in Honduras? He says, oh, it's great, it's wonderful here. We say, uh, we're a small company, we're thinking of coming here, but what happens if we get hit with labor problems? And the guy leans up, meanwhile, we've got an attache case with a camera in it pointing in his face. He leans forward like this, he says, labor problems? He said, when you came into the free trade zone, didn't you see the building with the barbed wire around it? That's the Human Resource Center. He says, in the Human Resource Center, there's a computerized blacklist that ties all of the free trade zones together and all the factories together. Anyone's ever been fired on a blacklist, they can never get into the factory. We heard that from every single uh, company that we visited. Then we wanted to get the U.S. government on tape. They never forgave us for this, but we called them by telephone, and we put a little wiretap on the phone, and we interviewed uh, U.S. government officials in Honduras, and they told us that the blacklist existed, they ran a top-notch operation, and the unions would never penetrate the free trade zones. We went to El Salvador, and we wanted to film someone on tape, not just the audio part. And we pulled a trick on the embassy, because you can't go into the embassy with hidden cameras and microphones. You know, they have all the metal detectors and everything. So we called the embassy and said we were sick. We had eaten something that had made us uh, feel ill. The water was no good. We needed to stay close to our bathrooms. The embassy <laughs> left, fell for it. They came to the hotel. We tipped the waiters. We moved all the furniture around in the dining room, and we set up hidden cameras. And sure enough, in walks John Sullivan, the head of USAID in El Salvador, and he sits at the head of the table. He's responsible for hundreds of millions of dollars of loans to people, businesses. He sits at the head of the table. Before he came, we had practiced eating without leaning over the table because we would get in the way of the lens. We're eating soup and it's dribbling down our shirts here. And he must have thought we were some weird sect, you know, people that had these strange habits. But we're sitting there eating and the soup's dribbling down. And he comes in and he goes like this, you're gonna make a fortune here in El Salvador. You can pay these people 40 cents an hour he says, that's a world-class wage. However, he said, start them out on the hourly wage, then speed them up and put them on a piece rate, you'll make more money like that. We ask him about the unions, he says, oh no, there's a blacklist here. This is the U.S. government. He says, I'll tell you how it operates. You want 500 workers, 1,000 are going to show up? They have the blacklist with the names and addresses of everyone who's been a troublemaker. Everyone is fired, they can wait. This one out, oh, it, it, that his brother's an organizer. Oh, that one, uh, too religious. He says, they'll get rid of all of them. You don't have anything to worry about. We were getting nervous. We wanted to get out of there with the cameras. Salvador's a violent place. But this guy wouldn't shut his mouth. He said to us, I suggest you fire your workers every year. Don't let them get uppity. Don't let them build up any severance package. Give them a year-to-year -year contract. And if you're really afraid about unions, then uh, why don't you start a solid rest of yellow union in your factory? He said it works very well for us in Costa Rica. This was the U.S. government. I mean, this was 1992. It wasn't 100 years ago. I mean, so... You can imagine what's going on if you're going to be a fly on the wall in some of these World Trade Organization meetings. You can imagine what's going on. No, I don't know. I mean, clearly. Uh, the number seems very accurate and clearly we don't have any labor law enforcement in the United States. We got 982 labor inspectors for 6.6 .6 million workplaces. Clearly, like in the apparel industry, one half of all factories are sweatshops in the United States. I mean, it's out of control. We're turning into a developing country. But that's a good question. I, I wonder. Well, no, I think you're, I think you're expressed it better than I could. I mean, that's that's what's going on. I mean, this is this is the system, and we've seen the poorest farmers in Haiti thrown off their land because of subsidized rice exports to Haiti. It's throwing people out, and you know we're we're so much in the trenches we don't get to lift our heads up too much. 
But when we do, we get quite frightened. Uh, yes, uh, Andrew Young's trip was a complete and total whitewash. Uh, he went through the factories on prearranged visits with Nike translators. They didn't go to workers' homes. They didn't discuss wages. Illeffable. I mean, I, I'm deeply embarrassed for him that, uh, that he ended up at that level. That was a disaster. And it carried no weight whatsoever. Um, Unite, we work uh, closely with, and in fact, well, we're both located in New York, so uh, we've started, I've seen a big change in the AFL-CIO in the last few years, whereas if we were, if before this we had gone into the AFL-CIO building, they would have thrown a net over us, and we would have never gotten out, I don't think, We'd lo they'd lock us in the basement somewhere. Now we can go into the building and talk to people. And, uh, you know, we're starting to get invitations to speak with steel workers and auto workers, and they're opening their locals to us, which is something that they never, ever did before. So, in that sense, we're seeing on the part of Unite and steel workers and the auto workers, food and commercial workers, some more action. And I really believe that the work is in the locals. It's not in Washington, or it's not in the nationals. It's out there in the locals, and, and that's, that's really, and in parishes, the same thing. There are 35,000 union locals in the country. Boy, if, if they start moving, and all the parishes and congregations and synagogues, they start moving, it'd be incredible. And the, the, what the colleges are doing, and now it's spreading to high schools. So yeah, anyway, long story short, we work closely with Unite when we can. I don't know. I mean, it's a, journalists often ask that question. They want to trace the origin of a garment from beginning to end, where the cotton is grown or where the synthetic fiber comes from, and be an interesting story. A lot of it comes from China, Bangladesh, Indonesia. So, I mean, it's it, incredible, the global economy. Recently, we found a gap factory in eastern Russia with South Korean factories, with migrant workers from China making clothing for the United States, and they were paying the workers 11 cents an hour. But the next, one of the steps is to follow the, to follow the, the, the fabric. We've more or less stuck with the assembly work because it's our biggest interest. We're going to come out with a story, we're going to come out with a report in about a month documenting Nike's wage costs. We've, we've come into Nike's documents. And, it, and now we have their own documentation on how much uh, time a worker gets to assemble a garment. So for example, for a Nike shirt, the worker gets six and a half minutes. Well, you figure it out. At 60 cents an hour in El Salvador, you figure out what six and a half minutes is and what it comes to. So for example, there'd be seven cents of labor in a, in a $22 shirt, which is what the worker's been telling us all along. But now we've got Nike's own documents, and they can't argue with us. We're just trying to figure out how to use them without getting sued. You know. I'm going to wait because I want to capture them by surprise. Like in other words, uh, any warning you give to the companies, it's, it, you know, I want to do this properly so Disney pays a price for what it's doing. We're, we're doing a unit on Shell Oil. Yeah. And we're trying to find sweatshop stuff. Yeah. Yeah. We, I don't know. Uh, much other than, of course, they wanted to bring the NAFTA to Africa um, and open up the country to the same sweatshop abuses. And it was stopped. <clears throat> but uh, you might know more about it than I do. We haven't, uh, we haven't really visited there. We've stuck more to Central America, the Caribbean, Mexico. Now we sort of go to China and Bangladesh.
Oops. Yeah, it's just like here, it really depends. I mean, if you worked in the informal sector, well, I mean, some women tell us that they can make as much money in the informal sector selling candy to workers going into the factory than they can make actually working in the factory. Some electrical workers make a fairly decent living. But there are no jobs. See, it's not, the question is, is, is nobody goes to work in the Maquila because they want to be there. And in fact, the Jesuits did a study in Honduras, and they saw the town of Progreso, and they saw it getting bigger, and the houses started to be made of concrete, and the rooms got a little bigger, and you saw TV antennas, they had televisions, and the companies always attributed it to the maquila. It's the result of good jobs. <clears throat> well, the Jesuits did a survey, house to house, and found out that those houses were built with remittances from the United States, and that if you had a person, a family member in the United States who was sending money back to you, you never let your children work in the maquila. The only people working in the maquila were people that had no other money. And so you get dragged into those things, screaming and kicking, but there's nothing else. Like if there's no other source of money, you're forced to take those jobs. And like I tried to say earlier, it's not a boycott and it's not an issue of taking uh, jobs away from the developing world. The women want those jobs, they need those jobs. Whenever we run a campaign, we say to the workers that, we will do everything possible to keep that company in that factory, but clean up conditions. And there's always a risk that they're going to pull out because they can teach a lesson to workers when they pull out. Because if the women stand up to defend themselves and they're thrown in the street, that's a good lesson for the entire country. That if you open your mouth against the companies, you're going to go in the street. I've had the New York Times come back to me and say that we were well-meaning, but we better stop what we're doing because the companies have no choice when we attack them but to leave and go to China and that the workers then are going to become prostitutes and peons and drug addicts and criminals. So they all want everybody to put their hands in their pockets and do absolutely nothing. This is about jobs with justice and dignity. It's not that there are other jobs. If there were other jobs, nobody would go into them and kill at all, period. It's meaning, yeah, in other words, they would add, in the case of the Nike shirt, where there'd be 20 cents of labor, there would now be uh, 39 and a half cents of labor. The American people have said in poll after poll that they would be glad to pay 5 to 10% more on a garment to be assured it was made under humane conditions. Well, that is far more than the little bit of money that would be added by paying a subsistence wage. In other words, it could be, it could be done. If Nike wanted, Nike's uh, uh, corrupt and, and so, if suppose they wage the, raise the wages to 39 and a half cents per shirt, well, Nike would surely charge the American people a dollar or two more. The American people would pay for it and Nike would be even making more profits. But the worker would, but the workers would at least receive a subsistence wage. It's all possible. They're afraid because the minute the, the hole opens in the dike, they're afraid the whole system's going to come down. Right now, they've got this whole system set up behind the barbed wire and the lock metal gates, and they want to keep it there. They don't want this stuff dragged out. This is why we're asking for full public disclosure of all factory names and addresses. If the companies have nothing to be afraid of, why can't they trust the American people with the names and addresses of the factories that make the goods we buy, and they won't do it? Because they're petrified that the American people will find out the truth about these factories. You can exploit kids and teenagers, you know, behind the barbed wire. If we win full public disclosure, which we will, students have won this already on 12 campuses across the country. You can't produce for the University of Michigan unless you disclose the name and address of the manufacturer of the factory that makes the goods. So again, the students are leading the way. I think we can win this like in a year or two and drag this global sweatshop out into the light of day where it's harder to exploit people.